Uh, I'm Rosie Bremack, and I'll be take, talking about a metric that optimizes user journey as well as product. And the metric I'm, I'm going to talk about today is time to value. This not so famous metric is from when the, the customer invests into your product by signing up to the time they get the outcome, which means, for example, their pain is solved. In between these two states, sign up and pain solved, there are steps that the user experiences to go through in order to realize that your product, in fact, is solving their problem. Before we dive deep into TTV, I'm gonna give you a bit, of a, a bit of a background about me, what I do, my framework, and how it came about. So I'm a data strategist, and I founded a company called Focus to Scale where we create content and coach companies on how to organize their data around their customer so they can build better products faster. We help them map out and implement a data strategy. And I'll explain in detail what that is in a moment. I've worked internationally in countries such as Malta, which is my home country, the UK, the Middle East, and I even took a year in Cairo where I volunteered um, for a year to teach English to refugees. In the Middle East, I worked with quite large corporations. Um, I'm passionate about digital transformation and I focus specifically on strategic alignment of data with operations. My career spans over 25 years and it includes a $3 million integration product, project of a real estate portfolio worth over $10 billion in Dubai. In this project, we worked with amazing, uh, we worked with amazing on, on amazing projects such as the Museum of the Future, um, the Dubai Eye, uh, and my role there was to bring together all the systems and data and create a dynamic real-time reporting that integrated all the systems and information into one. I then transitioned into the startup world five years ago, where I moved back to Europe to a SaaS startup called OneTap, now known as Dext which I'll tell you more about through the presentation. I live in, a be in beautiful Slovenia, the only country in the world with the word love embedded in it. And when I'm not talking data, I'm usually in the mountains with my dog, Ben. I'm married and a proud mom of a 24 year old boy. I'm obsessed with simplifying, not complicating, and finding, by finding ways in the form of content and coaching to make sense of the vast amounts of information that are available to us and, and enabling startups and scale-ups to optimize their user funnel and build products with customer acquisition embedded within them. So what is a data strategy and why do companies need it? So a data strategy aligns data, vision and operations and it gets everyone on the same page. And you end up using data not only to drive decisions, but to anticipate them. And, having, and by having corresponding KPIs and objectives that the whole team relates to. It's a 360 degree understanding of your customer too. By communicating and embedding a strategy right down to having everyone on the team know which part they play is by far the most challenging obstacle to overcome from the beginning up until when the company grows. If you add the volumes of data generated in the mix, you can quickly have a recipe for slow growth and bad decisions. So it's paramount that companies map out a plan, a data strategy that aligns with customers, product and their business model. With, without, without a clear data strategy, information gets lost among the many dashboards that don't indicate how to apply the data to the everyday activities and initiatives. So Focus to Scale creates content and helps you build that data strategy. In addition, the organization's mission, vision, goals, and strategy becomes separate when you don't have a data strategy from KPIs and metrics. This misalignment causes teams to look at their individual metrics and silos and come up with their own interpretation and personal conclusions of what the data says. It enables, the data strategy enables informed decision-making, which is vital for any future-driven company. And it takes a holistic view of a company, its vision, 
and how it conducts its operations and uses data to clearly show how customers are interacting with the product or service. And it also provides a clear set of goals and objectives across all company products, projects. Once, once this is a, using this as a baseline, once this information is collected and the teams are aligned, the business can now can then adapt their product to what the market needs today, instead of trying to sell something that might be in demand later or not at all. So what's the strategy of this framework that I've, that I've created? The strategy forces the company to organize the data around their business model, their product or service, and their ideal customers and their journey. In addition, by far the most important, I think, it aligns the entire business and teams with the business's overall objectives. So it's not just a few, uh, in, the, in the graphic I have here, you'll see these, um, either the three vision operations and data, the small boxes, VS, MS, FVS means vision statement, there are abbreviations for vision statement, mission statement. On the left-hand side, we have life cycle segments, the tracking plan, KPIs, on the right side, you have your current org chart, your future org chart, your racy matrices, your, your growth calendar, your job descriptions. And you may say, well, I have these, this is no problem. The secret behind the strategy is that all of these are aligned and people on the ground, the, the, the ensures what people do is aligned with vision and data. It gets everyone 100% on the same page and, tell, and they know how you're gonna get there. And most importantly, that you run the business on objective information instead of feelings, ego, and emotion. So today we're going to look more in depth on the left-hand side of the, of the framework, which is the data part. And we're gonna, we're gonna see where it aligns to, to, to TV. So the benefits of this framework is that it increases activation by constructing product data around your customer. So you can track, measure, and analyze their behavior. It maximizes your marketing spend and it reduces the costs of acquiring your customers because it incorporates customer acquisition into your product. It should also, it should also decrease churn um, by enabling you to understand the user flow of the product and understand where people are dropping off it reduces your time to value, which is what you want. You want your customers to get the value of your, of your product as quick as possible. And by organizing your data with the framework, you would be able to do that. An optimized TTV, why, why, would, we, why would we want it? And why would we strive to achieve it? So with, a, with an optimized TTV, you get to the market faster. You increase your customer retention because you're constantly optimizing the user journey and reducing any blockages, any, and, and, and you'll see where the drop-offs are. You um, increases the chances of a high customer uh, satisfaction. You get faster feedback on your product and you should start earning revenues from your product as early as possible. So it's a win-win. The next is I want to say something about growth hacking. There's a lot, there's a lot of talk about growth hacking, the lean startup. There's some really good books that have been written. And I'm not going to go into the depth of that because obviously um, there are people who are much more competent in, in, in explaining that than me. But what I wanted to do is that because I realized from personal experience, is that you read all these books, you learn all these methods, but how do you apply them? Um, like we know we should optimize the user journey before pouring more marketing money into digital campaigns. We know we need to experiment more. We know we need to A-B test more. And, and we know that we need to speed up this time um, from sign up to pay and solve, for example. We know we need to decrease the time. So how do we do that? And in the book, Hacking Growth by Sean Ellis, he actually devised a formula, which I see relating relating quite well with with TTV. He didn't mention TTV as such, but he he's he's cut into this formula, which is desire minus friction is equals conversion rate. So by increasing desire and reducing the friction, you get a better conversion rate. 
Um, and so if you if you align that with your sign up and you the, the difference between the friction and the sign up is is your conversion rate. So it's it's more or less the same thing. To begin to explore how how you can decrease your GTV, you can look you can look at the following. Can you get rid of signups altogether, for example, and let the user dive right into your product? Can you show perceived value earlier? Can you make it one click instead of three or three clicks instead of five? Um, can you can you ask fewer questions and reduce the barrier to entry? Looking into how to optimize your GTV is a continuous process. And by having the, your data organized in a way that supports that and measures it, which we'll look in today, along with asking questions like these on a regular basis, should ensure your conversion rates are at optimal. At optimum. So you ask yourselves, how simple can our sign up process be? And how soon can our visitors access the product. Let's take a look at how some well-known companies have prioritized reducing their products TTV for the user. So the first thing we'll look at is Canva. Can, can, I personally discovered Canva about a year ago and can honestly say I, I can't live without it. For those of you who have never heard of it, Canva is a graphic design platform for dummies, I guess, um, and it's used to create social media graphics presentations, and other visual content. So how did Canva reduce friction, increase desire, and make their time to value as low as possible? Well, without even signing up, you can work on a pre-built template. And they've reduced, so by this, they've, they've reduced their TTV to a minimum because their user can access, it could create the design and quickly see how easy it is to do so and achieve the wow factor as quick as possible. And only when you click download is the user asked to, to sign up. The next example is Uber. Uber, for I thought it was cool when I researched their positioning statement and it says, Uber is a platform where those who drive and deliver can connect with riders, eaters, and restaurants. Their frictionless process and optimized time for user to see value goes like this. You literally, for those who don't know, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you already used an Uber, but um, you sign up via your phone number. They ask you for, for permission to, to access your location, which is one of the only apps, I guess, you should give this permission to. Um, they automatically show you how cheaper it is than a taxi. And they give you immediate feedback as to when the taxi arrives. So. Frictionless, informative, and even if you've had a few drinks, I'm sure you can manage that. So they 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 give access, and you don't even need money or or to say anything to the driver. You just get in the car. He knows where he needs to take you, and you see value straight off the bat. A more deeper dive uh, of 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 TTV is through Chargebee. Chargebee is a, is a subscription platform. So sorry, Chargebee is a subscription billing and revenue management platform. And it claims to have a 100% increase in signups um, by reducing friction and increasing desire. So reducing TTV, as we said in the beginning. So it worked like this. After the few first, first, first few conversion experiments they ran, they didn't see any major improvements in the sign-up conversion rate. They, as we all know, knew that it sometimes takes numerous A-B tests to figure out where the blocks are. I'm sure you all know this. It's, it is, however, extremely frustrating when nothing seems to stand out. And their old sign-up flow worked like this. They had four, it's on the left-hand side, they had four fields that the customer had to fill in. And before accessing the product, they even had to do um, an account verification. So they sent an email verifying the account, et cetera. Their new flow was reduced to one field, and which meant that as soon as the visitors enter an email address and sign up, they get access to the product straight away. 
the delayed email verification process followed. And once they reviewed all the important features, they could claim their account and use the app within the app. So this allowed users to review all aspects of the product, see how they could draw value out of it, and make, thus making it more desirable to take action. They really nailed it. So 100% increase in signups, they claim. I got this from their website when I was researching. So TTV is definitely the way to go. I want to say something about vanity and actionable metrics, which I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite passionate about. So if this is what you're usually looking at, it's hard to figure out your TTV, right? Where your drop-offs are. This is not to say you shouldn't look at these metrics but they, because they can be useful. But how do you know when you look at Facebook traffic, overall traffic, website performance, how do you know what feature is working? How do you know is how long it's taking for your customers to see value in your product? What about onboarding? Is that new form you added uh, making onboarding quicker or is it delaying it? And is it improving conversion rates or is it slowing them down? Is it, is it reducing them, making them worse? If you're nodding your head, yes, I hope you are because I can't see anyone today. Um, I was in the same situation a few years back when I walked, when I started my job in a SaaS startup as business information lead. And this is the one tap story. So I, I after leaving the corporate world in Dubai um, with my heels and my suits, I walked in amongst these new millennials that were in torn jeans, sitting on bean bags. Um, there was food and booze in the fridge, something I'd never seen before. Bowls of candy, chocolate bars everywhere you looked. The rooms were silent. No one really talked to each other, but I found out that they slacked each other. There were many conversations happening, um, but they weren't the verbal ones I was used to. I felt like, I actually felt like I, I entered another planet. Um, each team spoke their own language. Um, they had their own, they had their own set of metrics. Um, they used their, some, some people use, some teams like the development team used Jira, the growth team used Asana. Um, so they had different project management tools each. Um, they, they, uh, they talk different metrics, so they all work towards different metrics. And if I had to combine all of this together, it was really hard to, um, to answer the questions I was being asked. So as, as information, as BI lead, I was supposed to report upwards um, to management, like, are we on target? What are we doing to increase revenue, for example? Um, my head of retention, um, Yasna was was worried about like which segment is using our product the most. Um, the de the dev team, you know, asking in the product team what what feature should we develop next. We also had kind of uh, internal little wars between like who owns the roadmap. So who who's going to determine who's going to determine um, who's going to determine what feature we're going to develop next. I was, we had a lot of data, we tracked everything, so that wasn't the problem, but we were disconnected be, so that the, the, the vast amounts of data were, were not easy to connect to the actual um, app and the user. So I, I, I needed a frame, I needed a plan, basically. I needed a framework on which everyone could work and be able to relate their work to. Um, something I could, uh, a, a semantic layer, of, a, a, a layer of data that I could report up with um, and, and tell management how we're doing and use the same semantic layer or framework to report downwards and, 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 uh, and tell the team, yes, this experiment is working. This is, this is not this feature we should do. This, this is the feature we should develop next, etc. So I needed something that we could all speak the same language with, yeah? We had a lot of leaks in our buckets. I don't know if you ever heard of the leaky bucket syndrome, but we didn't know where and what was causing them. And we knew we had the, we knew we could be smarter with data, but we, we didn't quite nail it in the beginning. It was the more money we poured in at the top of the funnel, 
wasn't making the difference we anticipated it was going to. So we needed, so we looked at creating a system that both our data and our operations revolved around our customer and how they were using our product. So that before we start pouring in more money, we had to fix the bucket, the holes in the bucket. If you look at the visual on the right here, um, it's something that we, we, we realized while we were doing this. So if we don't, at the beginning, we were looking at, you know, who was downloading our app, who was visiting our website, um, who was creating the most profiles. And the blue circles um, represented the ones, in our case, it was um, Uber drivers, because we, we knew what they were doing. They, they filled in a profile and we knew who they were. So we thought, when we looked at just here, just the, the marketing analytics and the, and the initial app, app downloads, we were coming to the conclusion that the blue circles were our customer, were, were our people. They're the ones who are downloading the most. Um, they're the ones we should design our lookalike audiences um, in alignment with. Um, they're the ones we should design our go-to market because we were, we were due to launch in the US. So we thought that, that the, the, blue, the blue circles, the Uber drivers in this case, were, the, were, the, were our champions, were our power users. However, when we looked deeper and we, we, added, um, we added product usage and journey metrics to the segments, which I'll talk about, we realized that it was actually the red circles. And the red circles represented, in our case, it, they were entertainment. They were pe the people in entertainment um, that were using this, this app, um, and they were the ones really championing it. So we, we, this is actually the, we segmented our users first by, and, and to do this, we segmented our users first by journey, then again by activity. We created KPIs around these segments and whatever anyone did had to link to one of these segments and KPIs. So by making and, and this obviously improved our TTV it improved the, it, it optimized our customer journey and we we knew we knew we were targeting the right people then and it all it's all around in implementing product a product led growth as well you read a lot of books and they say right yeah, this is the way to go find out what your, what your customers want um, and build, build it in that way. But you, you need your data to be organized in that way to do that. So by building, when you, you're building a customer, when you do product-led growth, you're actually building a customer acquisition engine within your product. And it becomes your day-to-day -day focus. Um, and, and all the activities are, are designed to revolve around the customer. When you build it first, relying on metrics that are not related to the customer journey, then you're going to have to convince your customer you've built the product for them after you've built it. And so because TTV measures how quickly your customers think they benefit from the value of your product, you need to involve them in the while you're building it. Otherwise, you, it's gonna be very expensive. You're gonna to need to pour a lot of money into, into um, into digital ads and, and marketing. And um, it's, it's, it's not the way to go. So how do we do this? We all, we all know we need to do product-led growth. We all know that um, vanity metrics doesn't really, don't really help us um, optimize our, our, our user journey. So how, how do we get started? How do we implement TTV? So you've read the books, you've listened to me, and I'm, of the, I'm hoping that you now are somewhat convinced that prioritizing TTV is, is, is key. So I've put together this framework and I did this in one tap. Um, and throughout the, the past five years, I've perfected it and um, implemented on in, in other companies and, and they've been, it's been very successful. And it basically has four steps. You segment, you track, you measure, you execute, and you repeat. Each step of the framework, there is 
some elements to it. So step one would have life cycle segments and behavioral segments. Step two is track your, your tracking plan that really, that links everything together in this. Um, step three is measure. You have your KPIs, your North Star metric, and your visuals, your dashboards. And step four is execute, where you have your growth calendar and your execution plan. And these are all, these are all with, with these eight elements, you have the foundations to create a rapid experimentation environment, to implement TTV, to measure it, to, um, and to create a, a product-led growth environment and, and optimize, optimize your user journey. So today I'm going to look at, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through a bit a step one and step three because they relate directly to TTV. So we're gonna we're gonna start from that. So the step one, you go into life cycle segments. And life cycle segments are groups of users that are divided by where they are in the journey within your product. Behavior segments are a subsegmentation of that. And we divide them further by their level of activity. So we understand who is using our product and how. Here we have a typical life cycle and everybody's could be different. Um, I've taken a typical one where, and, and the gray boxes in the bottom, I've put where like a typical events that core events that, that transition um, a user from one life cycle segment to another. We segment again. So the next part is the behavioral segments. And behavioral segments are life cycle segments with the addition of activity events. For example, a trial user is someone who has signed up to try, try out your product, right? But an active trial user would be someone who signed up and tried some of your features. The latter would be easier to convert. So, but then if you make your behavioral segment more specific and include time, for example, an active trial user is someone who has registered and performed an event, for example, in the past seven days. This gives you an indication, it's a dynamic segment, and it gives you an indication that it's quite a hot lead and allows you to target and send offers or try experiments on just those active users um, and measure their conversion rate instead of trying to experiment with the whole segment. Because let's face it, Somebody who signed up three to three or six months ago, who registered and has never used done anything or used anything in your app or your product, um, is going to be less likely to, to convert than someone who has really tried out your product and has done so quite recently. So this gives you the ability to measure your time to value from one behavioral segment to another. So here you see you've got your time to value from active trial user to active anonymous, there you can see how long it takes these dynamic segments to go from one segment to another. And up here, I've put in this, this pink box, it's kind of like the friction box. And this is what I would suggest you, you focus on first to make sure your, your users are accessing your product as fast as possible. And this, this part, whatever you call it, is the part where you'd need to, um, sorry, this is the part, this is the part where you'd need to focus on um, initially. So to summarize, to summarize what we've just explored, a behavioral segment is simply a life cycle segment with active events. And when you subtract uh, when you subtract one behavioral segment, the one, for example, that you think that that's where the, 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 the customer has realized that the pain has been solved, to uh, the behavioral segment where, minus the behavioral segment where they've signed up, that gives you the TTV. So that's your formula for, for TTV when it comes to when you apply um, behavioral segments and life cycle segments. The next part of the framework that I wanted to, to, to do a, a deep dive in 
is measure is step three, where we measure and we visualize. Um, and this has three elements in it. It's got KPIs, North Star metric, and your visuals. KPIs are like your GPS navigator. And when they're linked directly to the North Star, you can you could remain, you can, you can you could be sure that you're that you're focused on the right, the right um, objectives. Um, the North Star is where the focus is and should be. And all the, the teams, their, their KPIs down to their individual KPIs should point and align to that North Star. The KPIs build, are, are the KPIs kind of supports it. And even in your sprints, like when you, when you, when you map out your sprints, map out what you're going to do for the week or for the, however long the sprint is, each activity should be linked to one of these KPIs, which are in turn then linked to the North Star. And that's how you get the team aligned um, and focused on the same thing and, and talking the same and talking the same language. The visuals in this part of the framework are basically the dashboards. So they are the ones that are going to show you what's working and what's not, and actually you and, and allow you to visualize um, this the whole framework and and how it works. So with our behavioral segment set up, we can then measure the time taken for users to get from one behavioral segment to another. Once the initial TTB is optimized, so this, this part here, right? This is like the initial part from active anonymous, whatever you call it, to active trial. Once you optimize that, you can then, you know, why stop there? You might as well, um, optimize the whole journey. So once you start here, you you then move on to other other parts of the journey, and you you go in and you try to reduce the time taken. For example, from active lead to active anonymous, and you reduce the time taken from active trial to active paying. And by doing that, you then you're optimizing the whole user journey, and that's when you're ready to scale. That's when you can start pouring money and getting in more leads because you're, 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 there's no leaks in the bucket because you've, you've optimized every step of the way and you have the visuals to show you, to show you where, you, where you're going right and where you're going wrong. And you, and you, have, and, and you know when you've, you, you've, you've, you've reached that threshold where you've optimized it. The North Star, is where the team's focus is, as I said. Whether it's marketing, sales, customer success, support, if all the team work together, provide feedback, and look at the same dashboards, at least one dashboard everybody should be looking at with these KPIs and the North Star, because they should know what, what they're doing, what it is they're doing that, that is impacting this. Everybody should know what the, and the North Star metric is, and everybody should know what, how their activity of that week, of that month, is relating to that North Star. So when they look at the same dashboards and talk the same language, it provides seamless operations, whereby everyone is on the same page, they know what they're contributing and how they're contributing to it. And so for me, I would, I would suggest uh, uh, as, an, as a North Star metric until the, the whole, uh, User, user journey is optimized, I would have to, to, to decrease uh, TTV overall in all sections of the, the, in all sections of the journey to be my North Star until it's all, all settled for that. Once you have your data organized in this way, you can easily visualize it. So the lines on the left here should be this is the this is the line that you want you want to go down. They rep each one represents the time to value for a specific. So from um, lead uh, lead to active lead, from active uh, from anonymous to active anonymous. Each line represents one one segment, and so you want that you want that going down. You want that going down fast. So when you're adding a new feature, this is really cool to see. So when you add a new feature to your onboarding, for example, or you remove the fields in the sign-up form like Charge we did, um, you should be able to see 
not only if signups increased and by how much, but also how long it's taking for your user to see the value of your product. And so then with your with these visuals, with these dashboards that link to all this, you can you can you can easily find out where your where your customer, where your users are dropping off, what's preceding activation, what's preceding churn, um, and which features are actually speeding up onboarding and which features are not. Which experiments are working, which experiments are not. So we need to see that we segment by journey and segment again by activity. We need to track the time taken to go from one segment to another. We need to reduce the average time taken. Sorry, Siri keeps coming. We need to reduce the average time taken to go from one segment to another. And when this intention is applied, to all segments, you can optimize each transaction, each transition, and end up with a lower TTV overall. Most of all, you can stop, you, you your leaky bucket stops. You, so you 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 fix all um, all the, the the holes in there, and you you because you've optimized every every stage of that funnel. You make everyone's you, you're monitoring your TTV. You make everyone's objective the same by creating unified KPIs and aligning team activities to them. You build a customer acquisition engine into your product and you focus on retention so you can scale and maximize your marketing spend without it leaking through the bucket holes. So, I, as I said in the beginning, I founded, I've created this, this framework because I really believed that um, there was a missing piece of the puzzle. The, 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 everyone's wants, everyone knows that we need to experiment, we need to do all this, but we didn't have, we didn't have a framework or how to set up our data in a way that supports that and how to, how to, how to align our teams in the same, in the same way as well. So, I'll, I'm going to give you a quick look of the programs we we offer, and and they all they're all based on the framework I spoke about today. They all optimize your TTB because they focus on improving the user journey and how the user is interacting with your product and service. the The first one is the the framework. So this is an online online course framework. It's everything is there. We show you how to um, segment your life, segment your user by creating your life cycle segments. We cover how to, to sub-segment them into behavioral segments. We, um, we, sh we give you uh, templates and tools of how to set up your tracking plan in alignment with this. So not just like a normal tracking plan that doesn't really relate to the customer sometimes and how, how it actually how actually operations are working, but this tracking plan aligns all of this together. We, um, we give you examples of how to set up KPIs that align with your user journey um, and your behavioral segments. We show you how to set up your dashboards in Google Data Studio and some other examples as well. We also show you how to set up a growth calendar, which means that when you run your experiments, what happens sometimes is, is there's no plan or there's no structure to it. So, so you run experiments overlapping with each other and, some, and it's hard to figure out which one worked and which one doesn't. So sometimes you see a spike in signups, for example, and you can't really see, you, you don't know what, what caused that. And that's a shame because that's what you, you want to know what's going right, what's going wrong. So setting up a growth calendar allows you to really structure it in a, in a way so that when you do experiments, you plan them, you specify which KPI you're trying to impact, and the KPI is also related to your segment. So it's all nicely tied in. Um, we show you how the North Star metric actually links up with your KPIs, and we give you examples of that. And in the end, you end up with a fully functional execution plan, which is basically your data strategy ready. So you, you actually end up with a data strategy 
at the end of the online course. Our coaching programs, um, our signature one is Lead with Data, um, and it covers it covers all of the elements I showed at the beginning, and it basically it it, it allows you to go from decision from data driven to being to using data regularly to anticipate decisions and it allows you to lead with data um, so making data like a daily habit um, which is 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 key to um, whether you're if you're a scale up or a startup it's gr it's a great foundation to have so then you can scale properly and if you're a, a more mature company in order to to thrive in the in this, this information overload data um, world, you need to make sure you you've got this set up so you're you're future proof. You you you're, everything is aligned um, in your data strategy. Um, our second program is Scale Your SaaS, and it's specifically for SaaS startups and scale ups that want to do more with their data, understand their customer better through segmentation journey metrics and focus KPIs, and it provides a clear vision for your business so you can focus and scale. And the last, uh, but not least, it's, uh, it's very close to my heart. It's a data 360 coaching program for female founders. And basically it's because only 2.3% in 2020 of VC funding went to female led startups. And it, that dropped from 2.8% in 2019. So Data360 for female founders gives women the confidence to build a product-led startup, achieving product market fit, setting the right foundations to scale. And this is my contribution to leveling the playing fields. Sorry, guys, I, I help, I help um, male-led as well, but this is specifically for female founders, this one. So it gives women a, deserves, a deserved head start when it comes to being confident about using data to build their products. And the Q1 2022 waitlist is now open for applications. So um, thank you very much for listening today. I don't know if I have any, if there's anybody that wants to ask, I'll just switch to the other screen so I can see. Um, hi, Kate. Uh, sorry, there's a bit of a delay to say hi. So. Uh, uh, again, this is me. You can you're free to to um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I've written some articles on Medium as well on data strategy, on behavioral segmentation. You're, you're welcome to 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 try to to look them up. Um, the website focustoscale.com. You can from there you can book book a discovery call with me. Um, and discuss any any issues you may have or any if you want to ask any more questions about um, implementing a data strategy in your own company. Um, so I'm, I'm opening the floor for questions now. Is there anybody here that would like to ask and ask me any questions? Anything that you, you weren't clear about? And I also like to thank um, the Parallel team for organizing this webinar. Um, really appreciate their professionalism. Um, they were really, really helpful, and um, I'm really, I'm really happy to be on their board as well. Um, and look forward to working closer with their startups and their and their and, and, and the people they they help. So if there's no if there's no questions, um, I'm going to close close. Uh, uh, I'm going to stop here. Again, you're we're free to to um, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, ask any questions, and I look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thank you.